Hi, everybody. I'm Patricia, and welcome to Grow, Heal, Inspire, Change. And today I have with me Mark Dawes. Mark Dawes is at Mark Dawes QT on Instagram. Mark is a quantum thinker, author, and public speaker. And Mark is here to talk about mindset, universal laws, and how the power of the mind can help people heal. Hi, Mark. How are you? Good, good Patricia. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, I'm glad that you could be here. So let's start with what does it mean to be a quantum thinker? We're talking about quantum physics and the laws of the universe, right? Yeah, basically. I mean, the name quantum thinking is just something I made up. So I would give what I did a name because what, what I do is quite eclectic in terms of the scope of study and research I've, I've done and in terms of what I do and how I help people. But yeah, quantum thinking really is about using the mind to affect the smallest parts of our being so that can affect the whole you know the, the larger parts of us absolutely so everything in the universe is energy so maybe we should start there yeah sure yeah i mean if if you think about us as in human form uh, this this body that we have if we look at it through an x-ray machine we see all the organs uh, the spine and the skeleton uh, then if we looked at it through a dark field microscope, we'd see the cells that make up our body, which is roughly 50 to 60 trillion cells. And then if you go further, our cells are made up of atoms and atoms made up of subatomic particles. Now, for years, they said that 99.9999% of an atom is empty space. So if we just bear with that for a minute to give us some sort of scope on this. If we took all of this alleged empty space out of every cell in our at every atom in our body the physical stuff that will be left will be no bigger than a grain of sand or a pinch of salt and if we did that to all roughly eight billion people on the planet the physical matter that would be left would, would fit inside something no bigger than a tennis ball or an apple is here so if you think about einstein's equation of e equals mc squared energy equals mass that's traveling faster than the speed of light and we are, in effect, energy. You know, our whole physical presence is energy. Mm -hmm. um, now, that emptiness is, is energy, and we affect that energy by the way we choose to think. So our thinking obviously causes vibrations, not only within us, but out there in, in the zero-point field or quantum field. Uh, but it affects every subatomic particle in our body. And we must also consider that these subatomic particles popping and out of existence all the time so we're not permanent we're forever changing you know billions and billions of of, of atoms uh, the subatomic particles are dying and being replaced every day every time we breathe in we ingest new subatomic particles and atoms every time we breathe out we exhale them that's the same with food and drink so we're in a constant state of flux so we're not permanent we're basically energy and if we consider that, when we pass on, when this physical form is no more, then the energy transfers. So death is not death in the sense of it's permanent, you're going to be nothing. We're going to live on in different forms because everything in the universe is connected. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I've always heard that nothing exists in a vacuum, right? So this this 99.7% of everything they said is is nothing is really energy because there's no vacuum. So with that in mind, if you're the sum total of your thoughts, you know, negative in, you get negative out and, and neuroplasticity, um, this 99% is so much more powerful than people realize, you know, this energy and the way that we can influence this energy. So can we talk a little bit about neuroplasticity and how the, yeah. the negative in, negative out or positive in, positive out works? Yeah, so if we consider the, the neurological structure of our brain, our brains are made up of neurons, and these neurons come together to form neural networks in our brain. So there's an old saying that practice makes perfect, and it's actually not true. You know, practice makes permanent. So the more we practice something, <laughs> the larger those networks become. So if we have a good habit, and we're continually practicing that, and this happens whether we're doing it physically, or whether we're actually visualizing us doing it, or just thinking about us doing it, those networks are being affected. So if you th think about someone who drives a car badly, but who's very good at driving a car badly, they have a very large network in their brain to be able to do that. And that's why it's become such a habit and part of their persona. So if we look at someone um, who's, let's say, had a, a past trauma in their life, 
uh, something bad has happened to them, uh, they'll have a large network in their brain that will be associated with that event. And the more they think about it, and the more they talk about it, the bigger that network grows. Whereas if we switch, because the brain, the, the brain processes cannot process a positive and a negative emotion at the same time. Mm -hmm. They only have one or the other. So if we switch to thinking in a more positive way, then we build a new network. And if we stop thinking in a negative way, the old network dies and a new network is replaced. And, and that's basically what brain plasticity is all about. Our brain, like every other part of our body, is in a permanent state of flux. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. I love that you said particles make permanence. It, oh, practice makes permanence. Excuse me. Practice makes permanence. So it's not perfect, but permanence. And I love that because yeah. that's exactly what people should be thinking about. The more you keep thinking about this thought, the more neuroplasticity you're making and the more you're putting towards that, whether it be negative or positive. So why not put it towards the positive and catch yourself and be aware of it? So that's beautiful. Um, okay. So I want to talk, everybody knows about the law of attraction, but mm -hmm. I don't know how many people know about some of the other laws, like the law of assumption and the law of assumption from my understanding, works on the basis that you already have it. So how is that different from the law of attraction or is it just more of like um, being positive? Well, the law of attraction basically states that what you think about, you bring about. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that for me, that it, it infers then that there's a delay. There's going to be some sort of time delay. You need to think about it and at some stage it's going to appear. Okay. Um, the law of assumption means that we have to assume that we already have it. Mm -hmm. So... That delay is not there. Now, in terms of the infinite quantum field, everything that ever was, everything that is, and everything that will be already exists out there. Um, in quantum physics and mechanics, they call this superposition. So in the fifth dimension, there's no time. In the relative field where we live, when we think about what we want, and I'll come back to the word want in a minute, we're, we're, we're coming from a position of lack. And if you come from a position of lack because you don't already possess it, all the universe will do will give you more wanting for it. So Neville Goddard and all the other great thinkers speak about this quite eloquently. They say for us to actually have something, for us to acquire something, to manifest something, we must start from the, the end in mind. We must start from the position that it already exists. We already have it. And then we become grateful and thankful for what we have. And that then uh, gives you an elevated heart emotion, mm -hmm. which needs to align with your mindset, with your thinking. And once that happens, that's when the miracles occur. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think people don't realize how magnetic the heart is. You know, so if we have the thought and then we magnetize it in the heart and we're really pulling that in, you know, we're pulling in that energy. So our mindset is essential to our health. I mean, it really sounds very simple, but it's it's like, it's a practice like anything else. And people have to understand that they have to, like you said, assume you already have it. So that's kind of like the um, fake it till you make it idea or no? Yeah, I suppose, yes, it is. And there's probably no of that there where some people is, is no, it's not. Because if you're faking it till you make it, but you're coming from the assumption that you already you're have faking it, it, right? <laughs> then that, that's good. But if you're faking it and you're saying, yeah, I really want it, but deep down inside you feel you're not worthy or it's not likely to happen, you yeah. have that underpinning psychology of lack or you, you've got a limitation in, in the mindset, then that's not going to occur. You know, So if, if you want to fake it till you make it, yeah, do that. But you must come from the assumption that it's already happened. Yeah. So even the word fake it is probably not something you want to use, because if you think about that, then you're thinking that you don't really have it on some level on some quantum level or energetic level. So the word fake it is probably not something that should be in the mindset, I would think. It, it shouldn't be in the narrative because uh, the words we use are an expression of what's going on inside of us. It's an expression of our thoughts, our psychology, and our, and our, our, inner, our, our inner being. So if we're saying, I'm going to fake it, then by default, we're accepting the fact that it's not real, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay, so your brain doesn't understand a negative command. So how would you phrase something for wellness and health? Because you can say like, I am healing, I am healed. I Like how, how are you phrasing things so that you're not putting negatives in there? Like I don't have cancer or whatever people might be saying. Because if you're putting a negative in there, how is that affecting things on an energetic level, do you think? 
Well, if you're putting a negative in there, it, so if I say to you right now, don't think of blue elephants, you're, you're going to think of blue elephants and try and stop it because the mind or the brain can't process a, a negative command. It has to have something to, to be relative against. Mm -hmm. So if you take a child, for example, and I'm guilty of this with my children a little, they go to the fridge, they got a pint glass, they top it up with chocolate milkshake, and then they walk over your living room carpet. The fear of the parent is they're going to spill it. So the parent says, don't spill that. And the child stops and says, huh? And then they spill it. And then we reprimand them for the instruction we've just given them because the child wasn't thinking of spilling it. The child was being careful. So when we say don't spill that, the interpretation of that has to be spill it, don't. And there was actually an interesting uh, research study done between the England football team and the German football team uh, when it came to penalty shoots out, shootouts because um, England has got a pretty bad history of losing when it comes to penalty shootouts. <laughs> so they, okay. they looked at the mindset of what was going through the players. Mm -hmm. And when the, the English player put the ball on, on the penalty spot and was walking away from it, their mindset was, because of all the misses that had happened before, was... I better not miss, I better not miss, I better not miss, which is I'm going to miss, stop it. Mm -hmm. But there's also then the collective, I call it collective hypnosis or collective suggestion, mm -hmm. where all the fans are thinking, I hope he doesn't miss, I hope he doesn't miss. So mm -hmm. all of that combined gives you a massive negative energy and they miss. When they compared that to the mindset of the German players, when they put the ball on the penalty spot and were walking away from the ball, they were thinking, which corner of the net do I need to kick it in to score? Mm. They weren't thinking about missing at all. And the, and the German supporters were, were all willing them to score. So it's a completely different mindset collectively and individually. So when, when we're phrasing things, I would always look for the polar opposite. So if I don't want to do that, what is it I want to do? And one of the biggest uh, failings with people when it comes to wanting to be successful, if you like, or wanting to follow their passion and do, you know, live their dream, is when you ask them, what is it you, you actually want to do? They say, well, I don't know, but I know what I don't want to do. Mm. And they can write a list of what they don't want to do. And as, I mean, as, as a therapist, I've, I've had people come into my office when I was doing consulting. And I'd say, uh, you know, I had one lady who, who kept getting into a dysfunctional relationship every time one would enter into another one the same thing would happen mm -hmm. and i said i'll go put the kettle on write down the ideal characteristics of the type of person that you would like to find to spend the rest of your life with and when i came back she'd gone down one side of the paper and had turned it over and i thought wow she's doing really good mm -hmm. but when i read it it was i don't want a person that treats me like this i don't want a person that treats me like that i don't want a person that does this and I said, where's the positive bits? She said, I, I can't think of the positive because wow. she's had that much negative in her life. The, the, new, you know, the neurology of her brain, she had a massive negative network for that. That's mm -hmm. all she could think about. So okay. this is where you get patterns of behavior build up over time because mm -hmm. people are thinking in, in that way. Yeah. I mean, patterns of behavior are so strong and powerful. So yeah, I can see that. And then of course, in that phrase, I don't want you know, it's canceling out the negative, but you're still not getting what you want. So it's saying you want and then putting the negative on the tail end, or how is that energetically working, do you think? Well, even even the wanting, if if you want something, you're coming from a position of lack. You're coming from okay. the fact and that- And you're not coming from the law of assumption it. that you have it. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. you know, so, you know, it starts so with- I, my... So I have an amazing partner who is, you know- very communicative or something like that would be a better way for her to phrase it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So she's already there. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So how does someone change their thinking from negative to positive? Do you have any tips? I mean, there's meditation, becoming aware of our thoughts. I think sleep is really important. Do you have any other ideas of how someone can get from the negative to the positive, or is it just the way you're phrasing it and going with the law of assumption? Well, if you look at Muhammad Ali as an example, um, he, he would have his sayings before before a fight you know he, he would come out with this you know in, in round seven you're going to heaven and all these sort of affirmations that he had right. and they were all, they were all positive but he started doing that when he was a very young boy when he first learned to box mm -hmm. and he realized that the more he he stated stuff in the positive the more he was winning and then there was a knock-on effect with that where the more he was winning the more other people expected him to win yeah. so when it comes to doing this 
I mean, someone asked me an interesting question the other day. They said, will meditation make me a happier person? Uh, but you, And I said, well, it will, but you have to be happy to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, and Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Zen Buddhist master, he said, look, happiness isn't a destination. It's a choice. You make it now. So you start by actually committing to being happier. And one simple thing to do is if you get a thought into your head that's negative, is you can catch that thought and immediately switch it around to its polar opposite on the positive side and start mm -hmm. thinking that way. That's something that any person can do right now. Right. The one thing that's beneficial about meditation is meditation will teach you to stop and it will teach you to, to focus in the present moment. And that's really important. So if you combine that and you stop and you catch that negative thought and switch it to something positive, the more you do that, the more you're going to change the neurology of the brain. You know, this action, this simply thinking and switching your thoughts has a physical correlation in the brain where we actually build a different network. And the more we build that network, the more happier and the more positive we'll become. OK, so to get a little bit nerdy and scientific, which I love, um, I am into quantum thinking and quantum theory. I love to talk about epigenetics and genes. Do you think string theory applies here at all in what we're talking yeah. about, helping people heal? Yeah, they, because string theory came about because of, of the difficulty in trying to bring quantum mechanics and quantum physics into line with classical physics. So there's always been that gap. So yeah. string theory was developed to actually try and bridge that gap. And I think it's done a, a, you know, a very, very good job. But it's, what I would say is, is at the end of the day, it's they're all theories mm -hmm. so whatever works yeah. whatever works for the individual works for them it's, it's like spirituality or religion mm -hmm. you don't have to see it to believe it but you must have faith and faith is the most strongest thing you, you know you, you you can believe in stuff um and that's fine but it's faith that's the game changer so to give an example you know you, you can believe that a parachute works and that, you know, if you put a parachute on and you jump out of an aircraft, the parachute will open and you'll land safely on the ground. You, you can believe that. And it's true. Mm -hmm. But faith is strapping the parachute on and going up in the aeroplane and jumping out and testing the theory, you know. Uh, and that is, is important. And, and with manifesting or being happier or anything, you've got to have the faith to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so epigenetics and genes. Genes. I think with dis, dis ease in the body are about 3% really for the causes of all, let's say chronic illnesses and stuff like this. So that means that I've always heard this and I, I stand by this is um, genes load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So with that in mind, if we talk a little bit about epigenetics and maybe how like processed foods can cause chronic illness, you know, the, this goes into terrain theory a little bit versus germ theory, but but how do you talk about epigenetics and maybe like a little bit about processed foods and um, chronic illness? Yeah, well, epigenetics for people who don't know is is the sort of science above genes. And as you've stated already, when people say, "Well, you have a genetic disorder or it's in your genes and you're going to get sick," um, I think Professor Bruce Lipton has, has done this to death. You know, it accounts for probably two, or as you said, three percent of all the chronic diseases and illnesses throughout the world. Mm -hmm. you know, epigenetics is how our thoughts affect the cells, particularly the membranes of the cells, and how we program those cells. So, if you take the computers we're looking at now, you know, we can have a brand new computer. You know, so you can have brand new cells and your cells are renewed all the time. They're colliding and crushing. And because of subatomic particles popping in that existence, everything is actually changing and renewed all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, 98% of the, of the cells in our body uh, are, are new every year, every 12 months. You know, they're changing all the time. But if we had that new computer, but you loaded 30-year-old software onto it, it mm -hmm. wouldn't function. You know, you come up with viruses and, and it, would, it would break. And this is the, the problem. Pe people know, uh, intellectually, they know that looking at epigenetics, if we change the way we think, we can affect the membrane of the cell, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they change because everything's changing, but they don't change their thinking. Right. So, you know, you, you're loading old software onto a new system. Yeah. That's where, that's, that's that's where the great, That's a great analogy. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Okay, so negative attitudes and feeling of helplessness and hopelessness can create chronic stress, which upsets the body's hormonal balance. 
um, depletes the brain chemicals required for happiness and damages the immune system. Um, chronic stress has been shown to actually decrease our lifespan because um, science has said that um, the stress shortens our telomeres, the end caps of our DNA strands, which causes mm. us to age more quickly. So besides being positive and meditation, do you have any other ideas or what else do you apply in your life to keep yourself out of that place of chronic stress? Or is it just catching yourself and being aware of it when you get into that? Well, yeah, I've obviously like everyone else. So I've... I mean, what, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say, when I say that I'm not discounting meditation because I think it is so powerful and so is the positive mindset. So I'm not saying, is there anything else? I'm just coming up with any other takeaways that people can have. But I think those two are so, so, so powerful. So I just want to quantify they, that. They are. Yeah, I mean, physical activity is another one. You know, even if you go for a walk and go for a walk in nature, if you can, but go for a walk, getting going out for a walk, particularly in the sunshine is extremely good for us, you know, oh, yeah. and the problem is a lot of people today in, in our modern world, they're, they're stuck in front of the computer from literally when they get out of bed until when they go to bed, uh, they're getting no, no exercise whatsoever. You know, when I was a child, we, we used to walk 10 miles a day. That was common. You know, now people are jumping in a car and going 200 yards down the road to go to the shops. You know, so you can meditate all you want. It will have an effect without shadow of a doubt. But you need the physical activity as well, as much as you need the diet. So when I had a heart attack four years ago, um, and that came out totally out of the blue, and I was actually at a national sports center when it happened. Oh. Um, you know, it, so it can happen to anyone. It happened to me. I thought, right, OK, let's let's have a look. And I wasn't stressed. You know, I didn't didn't feel stressed at all. I'll just turn that in. Um, but, but what it was um you you tend to to cope with the level of stress that that becomes the normal in your life which actually isn't the normal right so every time you encounter stress you you accept it you deal with it and then your normal baseline shifts so when when i had the heart attack i thought right let, let's review this so i got home and it was just before covid kicked in and i thought right okay i've got this successful business um do i really need it anymore you know, and there's a lot of expectation on me as right. to to do a lot of stuff and help people. And I thought, well, do we need the business? And I thought, no, we don't. So we decided we, we'd take early retirement and we found a way to hand the business over. And then COVID kicked in. Um, so we had two years at home and I really enjoyed it because yeah. <laughs> I was, well, was with, it's the longest time I've ever spent with my wife since we've been married, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I could meditate more, you know, I, I, I could, when, when we were allowed, I'd go for walks, but I maxed out on the meditation. And I thought, I'll give myself a, a project and I'll heal my heart. Let's see if I can do this. So let's let's just test the, the theories here. Yeah, yeah. So, so I did a lot of tongue meditation. Um, I, I read up on monks that had healed themselves of cancer and people, uh, uh, sorry, of um, gangrene and cancer and all sorts. And I just applied what they'd done, mm -hmm. but in a really deep way. And when I had the tests in March this, this year, just gone, the, the doctor said, we had to send your test results back three times. I said, okay, why? He said, there's no scar residue on your heart. So I said, well, should there be? And he went, cause I'm not a medical person. And he went, yeah, oh, yeah you, you had a heart attack. There should be scar residue. Yeah. I said, okay, that's good then. He said, yeah, but it, it, I don't understand how. And I know he doesn't understand how, and he's a pr brilliant doctor because they're used to the the factual, this is the way it happens. Mm -hmm. And when you go outside of that mold and you apply stuff like diet, nutrition, meditation, mindfulness, you're you're going outside the, 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 the sort of conventional medical mold. Mm -hmm. But then I, I came across people, because uh, I, I didn't, didn't tell anyone to start with. Mm -hmm. And then I started, you know, talking about it. And I found loads of people have had similar experiences. You know, one wow. guy healed himself from cancer, from prayer. Wow. Another guy who, who actually is, is actually a friend of mine who came and trained with me on the quantum thinking side years ago. And then as a result of the operation, he had a stroke and they said he'll never walk again. Well, he's doing f freshwater swimming. He's done triathlons. He's, he's, he's absolutely amazing because his mindset is so strong. So diet is really, I mean, I, I don't eat meat. I don't eat chicken. I don't eat dairy, anything like that anymore. And the, the, the change, the end, I can feel the change in my energy levels. It's extraordinary. Um, and, and all of that combined, as, plus my, my faith in 
what I was doing yeah. has, for some reason, resulted in, in my heart healing. Okay, so I just want to touch a little bit on your heart healing because I think that's miraculous. I mean, when someone's had a heart attack, there will be evidence uh, when they do a scan to show the damage, the scarring, and you can always see that or you can see that for the rest of the person's life. So now you're saying that in your scans, that's not showing up anymore or it's very minimal. Well, that's what the doctor said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, so, that, he showed so that is is part and parcel for everything that you've done over this time. Like you had this mm. time to yourself to actually heal. And you mentioned a type of meditation. What type of meditation did you do during this period? Tonglen. T-O-N-G. Yeah, T-O-N-G-L-E-N. L-E-N. Okay. And that's something that you said Buddhist monks were doing and that kind of thing to heal their cancers, Tonglen meditation, or... That's just the yeah, one found. Yeah, yeah, they they do Tonglen meditation. There was another meditation that one monk was doing, which I can't remember. Um, but I found the Tonglen meditation for me worked really well. And it's also dog. Uh, our pet dog got very ill at the beginning of this year, and I it was know. quite. I, I read that, and I'm so sorry about Frankie. No, it's okay. And when we took him to the hospital, where he had to spend three days, uh, we we brought him home and. and the vet said look don't expect miracles he's very very sick he's probably not going to survive yeah. um so i slept with him um, every every night and i stayed with him and for about four hours a day i would practice tonglen meditation on him because mm -hmm. you can do it on others and yeah. he completely turned turned the corner he, he, he was eating his food he was taking his medication he was absolutely fine mm -hmm. unfortunately as with everything nothing's permanent and he succumbed to his illness in May and, and he passed away. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he passed in my arms. So that was good. You know, I was there. I was able to be with him. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and as sad as it is, that this is one of the benefits about, you know, well, I'm, I'm so pleased that I studied. Studying not only quantum mechanics, but studying Buddhism and other spiritualities, mm -hmm. particularly the understanding of impermanence uh, and energy and emptiness. I knew that he's, he's gone in the physical sense, but he's still here. Because yeah, energy, you know, can't be created, it can't be destroyed, it can only be transformed. Exactly. So he, he's in the house, he's in every breath I take, he's in every blade of grass that he's weed on in the garden. You know, I know, I, I know <laughs> yeah, yeah, is. yeah. He's growing yeah. in those blades of grass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever feel him around you and like his all, energy and stuff? All the time. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that all beautiful? The time. Yeah. Then yeah. you know, like you just know when you know. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that you were a therapist. What mm -hmm. type of therapist? Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Sorry, I missed the last bit. What, you said. what type of therapist were you like a? Oh, right. Well, I, I call it. I, I studied NLP, neuro linguistic okay. programming. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then I studied EFT, which is emotional freedom technique. Mm -hmm. And I became a cognitive hy hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing was, I, I I studied all three of those not to be a therapist. <laughs> I studied them because we were we were running a training co company, and lots of people would come to the training courses. And they'd be really anxious and nervous um, because they had bad experiences on other training courses. Even some of the ex-service personnel who, who come to train with us, they they would be nervous and anxious about taking exams and everything. Mm -hmm. So I did this to help them to understand how to best work with them whilst delivering a, a, the traditional training courses that we ran. And I then took on a few private clients, but I, I was never doing it as a mainstream therapy. But as with everything else, uh, we had quite a lot of success with it. So when we used to have training courses at the break, I'd have a queue of people queuing up. Mm -hmm. Everything from can you help me stop smoking until I've got a fear of flying and all, everything else in between. Mm -hmm. um, but we had a lot of success with that. And the meditation and the mindfulness has been part of my life for a very long time. You know, so that went hand in glove with that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's um, if you'd have asked me when I was... 17 or 18 years old when i joined the royal navy you know do you think you'll be talking about quantum physics and being a therapist I was, <laughs> no, not me you know that's, right? that's not me. yeah uh, it's like a different a uh, different lifetime right no totally absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah um you said that you someone healed from prayer that you knew that's just because of the mindset the belief that they already were there the faith i mean do you think that what do you think like really did it for them was it just the belief and the mindset i mean were they changing their diet was it all of the above um well there comes a point and you know about epigenetics where you can even question whether diets are important because you can right. eat all the healthiest foods in the world but have the wrong mindset 
And then your, your hypothalamus will, if you're thinking negatively all the time, the hypothalamus in the brain will secrete toxins. And I think for every one negative thought, we, we secrete 1,200 toxins, uh, which is why positive thinking is so important, because for every positive thought that you have, I believe you secrete 1,400 um, nutrients, and all of our cells need nutrients to communicate. But with regard to my friend John, yeah, he was given four months to live. And the doctor said, we're going to have to inject you in the stomach just to stop the pain. It won't prolong your life. Um, it's terminal. You've got four months to get your things in order, basically. Uh, John's a, a devout Christian. So he went to his church and they set up a prayer group for him. Mm -hmm. And then I, I believe the guy was from South Africa. He heard about, he, he was in he was in the UK. He, he was a healer from South Africa. I, I never met him. Mm -hmm. um, but he heard about John's plight. And he asked John's church if he could go and see John. And John agreed. So he went to see John and he prayed over him. And according to John, he put his hands on him. And John said, when he put his hands on me, he said, I felt like an electric shock go through my body. Oh. He said it was amazing. He said, and after he left, he, he said to his wife, he said, I'm going to go for a walk. Now, at this point, the cancer was in John's pelvic area yeah. and he couldn't he couldn't walk. And he said, I'm going to take the dogs for a walk. And she said, well, you better be careful. So he went for a six mile walk, no pain whatsoever. Yeah. And he then came back and phoned his consultant and he said, the cancer's gone. And the consultant said, well, no, it's not going to go, John. The, the treatments we're giving you is just to stop the pain. It won't prolong it. It won't take the cancer away. Mm -hmm. He said, well, can you test me again? So he went back and he had the tests and the cancer has gone, gone from his body. I love it. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I've got so many stories. Yeah, so many stories like that. that there are so many stories like that, and I think that you know when people hear those stories, it gives them hope that they too can do it because somebody else did it. Because there's really no difference except for, like I said, his faith, his mindset, and also maybe working with this particular healer that got him on the path. So that's beautiful. I mean, I'd like to say one thing here, Patricia, for anyone that's watching this, is I'm nothing special. You know, I'm just a bloke. I'm just a normal guy. I, I'm not a highly educated individual. Uh, I, I don't go to church. You know, I'm, I'm not religious in that sense of the word. Um, I don't think I read a book all the way through until I was about 22 years old. You know, so a lot of this is, has been something I've fallen into over time. And mm -hmm. the point I'm making with this is, is if I can do it, anyone can do this, you know, because I'm nothing special whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what people need as a takeaway is anyone can do it. You know, you just start where you are. Anyone can do it. Um, one last thing I want to talk about is um, Dr. Emoto for people who don't know about it. I know this is old research, but I think it's also so powerful that your thoughts can affect water and we're like 70 to 90% water. So <laughs> the old research that Dr. Emoto talks about is when he put thoughts like gratitude and love and and different things on the water it actually changed the structure of the water and that we can change the structure of the water in our body mm. oh absolutely Be because as you say we're 70 to 90 percent water depending on our age yes. and the, the research that dr emoto did was was outstanding and it's been replicated all over the world and peer-reviewed mm -hmm. and you know, you know if if we're if thoughts can affect water and we're 90 percent water then our thoughts must affect us and affect other people yeah. because, you know, we can pick up negativity around people. And if that's affecting them, it's, you know, it's, it's going to, it's going to have a physical effect. And one case example I can talk about was I was delivering a course once in Northern Ireland and a gentleman turned up, he was a lovely man and it was a hot day. And I always remember he had this tracksuit top on with long sleeves. And I said, why don't you take your top off? He must be roasting. He said, I can't, I'm too embarrassed. And at the break, he asked me to come into a side room and he rolled up his sleeve and he was covered in eczema. And his, his whole body was covered with his eczema. It was, wasn't on his head, head bizarre. He had one little patch on his forehead, but the rest of his body was covered in it. And he said, can you help me with this? I said, well, I can try. I, I never make any promises. I said, I'll try. So we put him under hypnosis and we took him back on a timeline and what we found out was when he was a very small boy, he, he got a rash and they called in the, the district nurse or the local nurse, whatever it was at the time, who had a very broad Northern Irish accent and he didn't like taking the medicine. And she said, if, if, you, if you don't take the medicine, if you're not a good boy, you'll end up with a rash for life. That was when he was seven years old. Uh... 
and he's and they were going to put him on experimental drugs that were going to affect his liver because every drug they gave him it would go away and come back mm. so we did an intervention with him and a lot of the intervention was based on um meditate getting him to meditate on this mm-hmm. and it was almost miraculous we we saw the psoriasis and eczema clearing up as, as we did the intervention mm-hmm. it was strange but this that was one clear example of how thoughts can affect water because our skin carries most of the water doesn't it that's where we dehydrate so when we get people with rashes and eczema and uh, all these other things psoriasis that goes back to basically the fact that we're not thinking right we're thinking wrong and all, all of the, the great physicians are now saying that 98 percent roughly of all the illnesses in the world that we're experiencing are caused by people being in distress yeah yeah stress causes dis-ease in the body and so does dehydration and as people get older i think they're just drinking less and getting more and more dehydrated and and processed foods contribute to all of that so so it's um it's a lot. Yeah. So let me ask you, I ask this of everybody who comes on the channel. What is your favorite quote? My favorite quote. Mm. That's an interesting one. Putting you I've on heard, the spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've heard so many. I, I think the one that's just popped into my head is, is anything and everything is possible if you believe. Yeah. That's a powerful quote. So I love that. So how do people get in contact with you if they would like to reach out? Is it Instagram or is there another way you prefer? No, they can get on me, hold of me on Instagram. I mean, my my e- email address is just markdoorsqt at gmail dot com. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I've, as I've retired now, I, I, it's brilliant. I don't have a corporate email address. I, I don't have a website. It's brilliant. <laughs> you know, um, and I, I just I'm getting a lot of requests. I think people are trying to drag me out of retirement at the moment. I'm getting a, a lot of requests to do a retreat. Um, and I've initially I've said no, but I just put a video out today actually saying that you know if there's enough interest, depending on where people are in the world, I'll, I'll do something for them. You know, yeah. I'm not interested in running a business. I'm not interested in selling them a product. We'll just do something that will help them because uh, I, I like the face to face interaction with people as well. So we'll we'll get something going. But yeah, if they want to get hold of me, markdoorsqt at gmail dot com, or hook up with me via Instagram, or I'm on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. So now you don't see private clients. You're just kind of um, doing this through Instagram and and putting out there your message or do you see private clients? No, I don't see private clients at the moment. I mean, if if anyone. That's what what you used to do. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, don't get me wrong. If any, if anyone needs help, I'm I'm, going to help them, you know, as much as I can, depending on where they're located in the world. So Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't turn people away, but I'm not running a a, a practice or a consultancy or a business. Right. Well, I think that's beautiful that you are willing to help people because it's just the right thing to do. And, and you've got that mindset and that heart set to do so. So, and I think sharing your story about your heart is so powerful and it will give people, you know, hope that they can actually make physical changes in their body with their meditation, with their thoughts. And I'll list the type of meditation that you did in the show notes as well. So thank you so much for coming on Grow, Heal, Inspire, Change. And thank you for helping people and inspiring them. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Bye.